right, guys. Welcome back to Strong Successful Mail. So for today, I'm going to go with this great email I sent from a subscriber. That's from a guy, I believe he is 64 years old, and he's sharing his story that spans 40 years, of which most of which with, with his late wife, who was a very rare, fantastic gal. A unicorn, if you will. And how he had a great marriage with her, but had all sorts of struggles, health, health, health problems with her, health problems with him. And sadly, she passed away relatively young, all things considered. And he's sharing his story, all his wisdom he's gained over the years, and also how after she passed away, what he did to get back on, back in the swing of things and the struggles he had, and I might add, how she was, wasn't gone very long, and all of a sudden he'd been being bombarded by all these gals trying to go out with him, because the guy obviously was doing well financially and all that, and how his experience, he actually went on Tinder for a little bit and saw the train wreck that was, and, and how, how just shameless they can be to get a guy who has does well and all that, even though his wife hadn't been gone that long. And how eventually he ends up meeting a gal the normal way, not on social media, and was able to have a second uh, shot. And, and he's happy, and she's a great gal, and all these positive qualities. So it's quite the story here of, of a guy's life, great wisdom he shares along the way, an actual story where somebody actually had a good, happy marriage, which we certainly need more of nowadays because this world's going to hell in a handbasket, and all sorts of things like that that I think would be very good to do this video on. I, I read his story this morning over breakfast, thought it was definitely good to go over here and thought a lot of you guys would enjoy this for many, many reasons. Now, as you can see, this is a long one, so grab your popcorn and uh, kick back and listen to this guy's story right here. He says, uh, hey, SSM, I've been watching your content for a bit now, and you give good advice. I want to tell you my story lasting 40 years. It's a long one, so feel free to do it what you want. It's a good story mostly, and there are some lessons I learned and would like to share. Admittedly, I was uh, shit-ass lucky along the way. I'm 64 years old and married with to my current wife. I have no kids, more onto that later. I spent my teenage years with my nose to the grindstone, studying, playing sports, and working on my car. I played with the gals a little bit, but, but time was limited, and since my parents had the foresight to stick me in all-boys school, I stayed out of trouble. Well, I'm sure that saved you a whole lot of trouble. And good for you being raised and having your uh, you know, ear to the grindstone. Uh, after I finished school, I had all the freedom but no money. I was working all kinds of hours, but I was learning plenty and gaining valuable skills. I loved it, all of it. Even though I was eating beans every night, I still love beans, by the way, because I was too stupid to cook. I was enjoying the single life. Later, I learned how and am pretty good at it. I was chasing the gals and having a good time. I had no desire to settle down and made that very clear. Most of the women understood. Some played right along with me, but a few were pissed off because I did not want to settle down with them. Well, nothing's changed. You make it abundantly clear you don't want to settle down, and they get, actually get mad at you for not wanting to settle down. I'd get it if you weren't clear about that. I made it very clear I would it would have ended in disaster, and I knew it, and they were still pissed off. I had my first exclusive serious girl when I was 25, and that summer was the best. We were really into each other, had some great adventures together. By summer's end, she decided if I wasn't going to put a ring on her finger, she was moving on. After one summer? She already had somebody lined up, of course. I was pissed, sad, and feeling rejected, but soon afterwards I said fuck it and moved on. And that's what you do. He says, spoiler alert, a year later he dumped her, and a year later she wanted to go back to sniffing around my truffles. If you guessed it, my answer was thanks, but no thanks, you win a prize. Of course she came back to you. They always come back when things don't work out. Fast forward a few years, I hit 30 years old, and the single life was starting to wear thin, and the mystery is pretty much gone. So I decided maybe it's time for, to find somebody with whom I can share my time. I'm still working hard, making more money, and doing pretty well. Well, even back in the late 80s and early 90s, the good ones are still hard to find. Yep. The following year, I lost my job and it put me in a tailspin. I lost nearly everything and, and I did everything I could to keep my head above water. I actually found one job and lost it a month later when the company decided to close the entire department. Anyway, <clears throat> I took some extra training and found a job a bit after I finished my training. So I started to build it myself back up. It was about this time the chat boards, dial-up modems, were coming online and signed up to a couple of them. I was, it was an interesting way to meet people and make some friends, one of which I, call, I still call a friend to today. I started talking to this one woman, and at one point we decided to meet at a bar and grill across the highway from where I worked and, and walking 
the distance from where she worked. Oh God, the early days of the internet with dial-up America Online, all that. The old chat rooms. At the last minute, she sent an email asking me to meet the next night as her boss wanted her to work late. I said, okay, but if she is playing games, we'll find out. The next night comes and goes, and she shows up on time, and her boss was with her. What? Was her boss there to cock block? She wanted to come along to apologize to me and then leave. This woman was very good looking, but her boss captivated me. She had the most amazing bronze skin. I'll call her Maria. I pretty much forgot about the other woman. I swear I don't even remember her name at this point. She soon, soon left and Maria stayed. So you had a date with this chick. And she had to blow you off at the last minute because of her boss. You reschedule. And then she comes with her boss. And it turns out you're more attracted to her boss than this girl. The next thing she leaves and you're staying there with the boss. That's a story to tell. And you are. She had a few beers. Uh, shot some pool. She kicked my ass and she had, had, had eyes like an eagle. When it was time to leave, I asked for a number and to my surprise, she gave it to me and told me she was leaving for vacation in her family's summer cottage, but would be back in a week and call her then. A week later, I call her and to my surprise, it's the right number and she answered. Then uh, that started a romance like the one of which I could never imagine. How about that? She was everything I could ever have dreamt of. She was a commercial artist and worked for an engineering company. She was four years older than I was, but it didn't matter. We clicked. Oh, well, if you're happy, I'm happy. I would have gone with a younger chick. But if you find somebody you really click with, you know. I met her family, and they were all very nice, though her mother was very sick. Her dad was a hell of a man, and I always enjoyed his company. My family loved her, and even my mother treated her like her own daughter. Well, that's great. Always got to pay attention to the families. Fast forward two years and we were still inseparable. She's starting to talk about making this official and permanent, but I wasn't quite ready yet. So I'm glad it's a couple years you're taking to really get to know this girl before. And I'm glad she's the one that brought up the where is this going talk. Good. So I told her, listen, I need a bit more time. The time I was out of work really killed me financially. If we want to have a good life together, I want us to have a good nest egg to get together on the best start. So I told her when I get to a point financially, we will move forward. She wasn't totally happy, but I but agreed. I kept my word. Once my goals were met, I proposed with a ring that I had custom made. More, more of that ring later. She loved that ring. She called it a Maria ring and actually wore it as both a wedding band and engagement ring. Okay, cool. She wasn't on board with your plan, but she went along anyway because you stuck to your guns. That's what men do. Being an artist, she planned everything and designed all the invitations. Had a custom wedding dress made, a bespoke a bespoke suit made for me, laid out the menu and picked the venue, all about $8,000 for 40 people. Now, I'm guessing this is the, the mid to late 90s at this point. So eight grand obviously bought a hell of a lot more than it does today, but still, you know, for a wedding, that's not that bad. The food was amazing. Scallops, tenderloins, asparagus, and lobster bisque. Everything, everyone to this day says it was the best wedding they ever attended. I have to agree it was the best one I ever attended too. She absolutely sparkled. Fast forward about 18 months and we finally find a house we both love and move in. Life is great. The next year she has some serious health issues and needed a hysterectomy. Uh-oh. Her recovery was hard and had some complications, so I took some time off work and took care of her. My boss was great, and I'll be eternally in his debt for giving me the flexibility to do this. I'd hide a body for that guy. So that's why you don't have kids, because she had the hysterectomy. She does recover, but kids, but no kids now. But that's okay. We have had each other, and that I was good with that. We get along great. We love each other's company and never fight. I think we've had three fights in our entire time together, and as sweet and as soft-spoken as she was, that Italian temper would fire up and she could land some pretty hard blows. <laughs> Those fights were traumatic. Yep, I've had some Italian girlfriends throughout my life. I always had a thing for Italian chicks. It's crazy, you know, or full Italian with the black hair, or half Italian with the, with the brown hair. It, it's crazy. Anyhow, yes, I'm well aware of those tempers. On the other hand, they can use that temper and turn it around for other areas that are nice. A year later, we get, get a dog, a blue tick coonhound. He was he was huge, but he was huge, but uh, she loved him and he loved her back. It was good because when I had to travel for business, he helped make her feel safe. More to that later. 
We jump a few more years, things are great. We get along, we get another dog, a bloodhound, and I get diagnosed with cancer. Jesus, first her with the, having to have the hysterectomy because of obvious issues. Now you got cancer. I was floored. Somehow I knew in the back of my mind, but getting the official diagnosis, it sucks the air right out of you. Maria, she turned into a warrior. She became my biggest advocate, researched, explored, and found the best robotic surgeon in the United States, and she drove me to my initial consultation. She tells me, I waited my whole life for you. I'm not going to let you go without a big fight. Dude, that's great. How many stories I've done where things go to hell in the handbasket and the wife is like, see ya, when things get tough or a guy gets sick. That shows a lot about her character. Hearing that made me want to fight even harder than I was already committed. I had my surgery, which was successful, and I was on my road to recovery. She enlisted the aid of my mom. Mostly, I think she wanted to keep me in line and not do anything stupid for my recovery. I did recover, and I am now cancer-free. Wonderful, bro. Now, during this time, she was promoted to an art director, and as her company grew and expanded, so did her workload. Eventually, she started working 60, then 70, then 80 hours a week, every week. That is way too fucking much. I mean, I get working crazy hours when you own your own company. Okay? I work a hell of a lot of hours, guys. An easy week for me is 60 hours. A busy, busy normal week is 60, 75. I do a hell of a lot more than the screen time on here, guys. There's way more going on. Plus, I have other ventures I'm working on behind the scenes. I'm fucking busy, but at least it's for me. But for somebody else, too fucking much. It started to take a toll on her health. She had an uh, autoimmune disease, and the stress and workload, it was starting to get worse. She gained weight, her blood pressure, sugar, and cholesterol all rose up. I started to ask her to try to cut back, but she told me she had these deadlines, and they were, they were relying on her to get the job done. I get you have the job and the pressure and all that, but there's a point you have to look at the big picture. And as you get older, these things are going to have serious impacts on your health, and you you got you to take care of that. I'm sure you guys would have made found a way. But, I mean, I know you know this, dude. But as a warning to other people out there. I told that in, in uh, 20 years, no one will ever give a crap what happened today. And that day you leave, you'll be forgotten. So she should off kill herself over this. She resisted and plowed on. You mean a stubborn Italian woman? Huh, who would ever have thought? All I could do was support her. A year after my adventure with cancer, she lost her job. Those assholes actually laid her off. Six months after that, her father passed away from cancer, and of course, it hit us both hard. She was in shock and was in tears through all this, but I told her it would be okay. Well, I'm glad again you're there for her, but yeah, after all the work she puts in, and it was taking a toll on her and knocking years off her life, then they fire her. This is why I say, guys, don't kill yourself for some company, because to them, you're just a number, really. If you own your own company, you own your own business, and you're busting your tail crazy hours, at least it's for you. I know sometimes you don't have a choice, and I respect that, but in that situation, while you're busting your tail for somebody else, and oftentimes they're taking advantage of you, start looking for something else. My career was stable and going well. Our house was paid for. We had zero debt, no car loans, fully funded retirement, and money in the bank. Most of all, we had each other, and we'd be fine. Soon after, word got out, and her reputation for excellence had companies sniffing around to get her to do contract work. So I, get a, I set up a company for her, acted as her bookkeeper and business manager, and got her moving. It was great. She was making double the money for half the work. There you go. Exactly. You know, she was busting her tail for those other assholes, and right? Her health improved greatly, and her numbers got back to normal. But the damage was done. Her health was getting worse until about four years after she started her company. And she had to shut it down because she couldn't do the work anymore. That sucks. I became her caregiver as well as continuing to work full time. We lived in New England and at this point her health was so bad we decided to move south to get her out of the cold. Ah, fellow New Englander, a fellow former New Englander like me. Yeah, I need to get out of the goddamn cold. It was, uh, I drove down here just now. It's uh, about three in the afternoon right now. Let me see. Yep, three in the afternoon. I'm looking at my clock here. And I think as I drove over here half an hour ago, because I filmed another video before this, it was like 72 in February. It was all worth it. Not to rub it into my former New England brothers, but can't help myself. 
Uh, we moved down south. It took two years of playing, but we set the move in the summer of 2016. At this time, I lost my dad and my mom within 45 days of each other, and it hit Maria hard. Oh, my God. She was super close to my mom. She lost hers in 1992, and my mom treated her like one of her own. The move distracted her, and we eventually did move in 2016. It was exciting, and she was looking forward to it, but that excitement was short-lived. Two months after we moved in and got things set up to accommodate her needs, she was pretty much confined to a walk to a walker or wheelchair at this point. She went into AFIB and had to be ambulanced to the hospital. She never came home. She ended up spending six months in the hospital and as various organs started to fail. That's terrible. I'm so sorry, man. I would visit her twice a day during the week, bring her breakfast and eat with her in the morning, leave her a good lunch and go back to visit her at dinner and with her in the evening. On Sundays, I go three times and have lunch with her. In this time, we would talk about many things, and one night she told me, you were right. I should never have worked all those hours. I killed myself for nothing, and I am so sorry. I told her she did what she thought was best, and she didn't have to apologize to me for anything. I just wish she didn't expand uh, so much effort and for such ungrateful assholes. I then apologized for all the times I lost my patience and, we short, and was short with her. She deserved better than that. She then told me I was okay, it was okay, and I was tired, and she understood considering the pressure I was under. I argued she's, she's the one going through this, and my actions were unacceptable, and please to forgive me. It's good of you to say that, and uh, obviously she knew you were serious and you meant that. But the past was the past. Her uh, reply was, there's nothing to forgive, you are my hero. I almost fucking lost it right then and there, I, and she said I feel the safest when you're with me. I did not feel like much of a hero, but I held it together and I changed the subject. Good. You are her rock, so you can't... Even though it's understandable if you started tearing up or crying, you got you, you got to be calm for her. I did not feel like a hero, but I held it together. We talked about many things, and she asked me to do something, some things for her, to which I've honored all of them except one, and for that one time, for that one it isn't time, but I will honor it when the time comes. Things went from bad to worse as she made two trips to the ICU in the span of, of a month, once during Easter. After her second stint in the ICU, she told me she can't do this anymore and she can't go back for another trip to the ICU. She was done, man. It, it was just too much. She was, it was her time and she knew it. I asked her if she knew what that meant and she said she did and I was okay with it. I told her I understood. I went home and bawled like a baby. She actually had a couple of good weeks until one Sunday when I went to have breakfast with her. I bounded down the hallway expecting to see her smiling face, but when I turned a corner, I saw a pack of doctors and nurses surrounding her nurse. I'm sorry, dude. I literally felt the blood drain out of my body and into my feet. I knew it was bad. They wanted to take her to the ICU, and she resisted. I went in, chased out the staff, and went to the lead doctor to talk to him. I asked him how long she had, and he said one day. I then asked him if there was any chance, no matter how remote, of getting back, getting back, and he said none. I went back in and asked her what did she want. She said she was ready and, and asked me if she was dying and, and asked me if she was dying. I hesitated and wanted to lie to her and say no, but but was always honest with her and told her yes. Y yes, I'm glad you were honest with her. She needed to know. She asked me how long I told her, and she told me no, no more treatments, and I said okay. I then called my aunt and sister and told them and asked them to look after my puppies because I was staying there to the end. I called my brother-in-law and told him that if he wanted to see his sister again to get his ass down here. He flew into action and got tickets. I stayed with her as she slept but woke up and, and said, my ring, I want my ring. I need to wear it one last time. I told her I had to go home and get it and she said okay. I flew home as fast as I could, had to tear the house apart to find it. I grabbed it in the wedding band and made it, and made it for her and of a gold coin to match her ring. I flew back, praying she was still with us. I got back, slipped in our finger, and she smiled. My aunt got my brother-in-law, and we stayed with her all night, taking turns resting. I don't, I don't think either of us ate. That morning, I held her hand as she drew her final breath. As I saw her life leaving her body, I could feel a huge piece of me getting sucked out. She took a much bigger piece out of me than one, one she, as she felt. The doctors pronounced her dead and we stayed together her we stayed to gather her things and make arrangements for the morgue to come and get her. I'm sorry, bro. Really I am. Because she was one of the great ones.
Yes, she said she was feisty and had an Italian temper, and, but always fucking perfect. But you had a great thing going. It's always the good ones that go young and the a-holes that seem to stick around forever. We went home with Silas and he thanked me for taking such great care of his sister. And I just nodded. I showed my brother-in-law around the area a few times, mostly to keep us both occupied, and made arrangements to, at the funeral home for her cremation. As owning his own electrical business, my brother-in-law had to leave. I was left alone to pick up the pieces. As the days and weeks went by, I never really left the property. I worked, ate, slept, played with the dogs. They pretty much saved me. And I would go out twice a week. Once to see my aunt and once for groceries. I started to clean up Maria's things and donate what I could. I found a wedding dress and I think I bawled like a beaten hound for two hours. After two days, I knew I had to donate it and I did. Hardest thing I ever had to do. I can't imagine what that's like. You're with somebody so long and you had a fantastic marriage to them, which is rare. And then they go. And then you have to imagine your life not with them because you've had so much time with them. And then clearing out all their stuff. I mean, that's got to be heart fucking heartbreaking. Again, if it was a wife you were miserable with and happy to see her go, that's one thing. But if it's someone that you loved and was fantastic to you, you know. At this time, I was on Facebook. Mostly because I was in-house. Uh... I, I looked at, uh, I was in car groups, hockey groups, and various music groups. But, but when I got out, I was recently widowed. Jesus Christ. I turned into a pig in an auction. I was getting direct messages by all these broads left and right. What the actual fuck? My wife's ashes weren't even cold yet, and they all knew this, and I'm getting pounded on. Including somebody that effing knew my wife. I'm not all surprised. She's, she's barely gone, and you're getting bombarded by all these women trying to get your attention, even someone that knew her. Why? Because I'm sure, obviously, you were seen as a catch. You were obviously well off, all those things, and uh, you're in your 50s at this point. I'm not surprised. They're fucking uh, shameless. As much as I enjoyed my group, I got the fuck off for several months. I told key people to email me if anybody had any good car or hound issues that I might be able to help with, but I was gone for a while. Yeah, it was that bad. A couple months later, I'm still living like a hermit. Working for home had his good points and bad points. Bad points being I am working 14 hours a day and I never leave the house. My friends are worried about me and tell me I need to get out. I agree with your friends. They need to get you out. I know I do, so I joined a couple of shooting ranges and start hunting again. It felt good to do these things again, but it was still pretty solitary life. A friend suggested Tinder just to meet people and not be a hermit. Oh, for goodness sake. So I joined Tinder. Smack! If your wife could appear back then like Obi-Wan Kenobi's ghost, like in Star Wars, she'd smack you. Tender? He says, don't even, don't even about slapping me, SSM. I'll slap you back. I know I fucked up. <laughs> Too late. In the world of nuclear accidents, Tinder is Chernobyl. I'll just give you the highlights. Keep in mind, I'm 57 years old right now. So he's, he's mid-60s now, but he's 57 when he was on Tinder. He says, contestant number one. Now listen to this breakdown of these hoe bags. Contestant number one, early 50s, married three times, lived together long term with number four. Can you say storm warnings? Turns out she already married one of her husbands twice. So in reality, married four times and lived with the fifth one. All of them cheated on her and abused her. Yeah, right. Contestant number two, early 50s, divorce, has a 10-year-old boy. Wants a daddy for her kid. Shocker. When I say no, she gets pissed and says, Who will be a better father to my boy? Oh, how about the actual fucking father? Not my problem and bye bye Contestant number three. 38 years old and smoking hot. Well, she was smoking hot because you're 57, not be, you know because she's 38. Any gal 20 years younger than you is going to be smoking hot. But 38, I'm sure, there's a lot of damn good looking 30-somethings out there, even 40s. But nothing compared to their prime of their 20s. He says, I mean, smoking hot resembles Catherine Zeta-Jones. Smart, funny, has manners. The problem. She wants a committed relationship that's open. That's an oxymoron. Gives me all the usual BS about insecure men, blah, blah, blah. I responded with, it's not insecurity, it's having standards. I don't share, I do not do sloppy seconds, and I most certainly do not wait by the table for some scraps to fall on the floor like a dog. She asked, are you calling me a dog? And I said, no, I'm not calling you a dog. I'm calling you the scraps on the floor for the dog. She was pissed. She got up and left. Even pissed off, she still looked good. 
me, I had a nice dinner, and after that I del deleted Tinder never to return. By the time I say, fuck it, I'm done, I had the best, fuck the rest, this is crazy. There you go. That's Tinder for you. And I'm sure there's plenty of other stories. Uh, time passes by, and it's coming up on a year after our move. I'm still a hermit, but, but one night I just had to get the hell out of the house. Screw it. I take a drive and see where it went. I get in the truck and go off. I drive until I come across this little coffee shop that looks like something you'd find in Boston across from one of the local schools. Bro, were you a mass hole like me? Are you from Boston? I'm, I'm guessing because you're bringing up Boston here. How about that? It says here, uh, I, st I stop, go in and grab a coffee. Good coffee, by the way. And I finish up, go grab another, and there she is. This gorgeous woman, about 35 years old. Ah, so no more Tinder or dating apps. You just go live your life. And get a coffee, and oh, there's this smoking hot woman you happen to notice, and uh, in real life, that you strike up a conversation with. Imagine that. Uh, she's having trouble explaining to the barista what she wants. Having experience with my Italian in-laws, I help her out. She smiled and thanked me, and we sit and talk. Turns out she was next, she was next door for English classes, as she was from Brazil, and she's not 35 or 55. You mean she looks 35? That's how damn good looking and well taken care of she is. Great. She chats some more. Google Translate is interesting but useful. Her friend shows up and she asks for my phone number. I give it to her and later I get a text to see if I get, uh, I've got home okay. She texts you to see if you got home okay. No, she didn't. She wanted to smack, actually make sure that, you know, that's the right number and she wants to obviously, she was reaching out to you so you could then reach out to her and probably ask her out. First, I think it was a test to make sure I gave her my number. We text back and forth casually, and I get to know, and I call her Bianca pretty well. We start meeting in person. I learn plenty about her. Divorced, two grown boys, one just graduated high school, and she's putting him through school on her own. Okay, well, okay, so she's divorced and single MOM. However, both the kids are grown-ass adults now, so uh, tread carefully. She used to be a direct at one of Brazil's biggest insurance companies, but a series of traumas had her on, had her move here. Okay. She learns my story. I could almost see her tear up at the bad parts, and I wasn't even sure if they were the crocodile tears, but I don't think so. Eventually, we started to really see each other, and she would stay with me on the weekends and go back home to work during the week. Uh, she is totally different than Maria, but she shares two big traits. She has a great family, and she's very kind and sweet and loving. Okay, great. He says, okay, three things. She has quite the temper. A Latina gal with quite the temper? No. Never. Never in human history. She's the first Latina gal with a temper. Well, just like those Italian gals, they can turn around that temper and put it in different areas that are beneficial to us guys. Uh, she's very outgoing, whereas I'm very introverted. I still had some bad days, and she was very patient with me. Things just kept progressing, and after three years, I married her. Holy shit. Well, after everything you've been through, there aren't going to be any smacks. But I would have waited a little longer than three years. But, obviously, she had, she had if she worked for a massive insurance company, she made good money. She had her own money. She could take care of herself. Okay, great. She was great with you. Great. Her kids were now legal adults. Great. She was beautiful and took care of herself. Great. So... Okay. Hope she liked dogs. I don't regret this for a second. Well, good. I'm glad. Life is as good as it ever was, and now I'm, a, I'm retired, and I'm helping her start her own business by doing all the administrative, legal, and accounting. Good. I'm glad you can retire, and I'm glad you're still keeping active. I tell her I'm like a little kid who needs little jobs to feel important. The arrangement works great, as she is like a peacock that everyone is drawn to, notices, and admires. Not all many women do like her. <laughs> and I'm more like a crocodile who hangs out in tall weeds with just his eyes above the waterline watching. Yeah, you're, gonna, you're married to a, a beautiful woman. Everybody's going to be paying attention to her. The guys are going to be drooling over her and all the gals are going to be giving her dirty looks. She says I make her feel safe and I told her one day in no uncertain terms that if any harm were ever to come to her it is because I'm dead and, she, and her attackers went through me to get to her. She looked me in the eye and knew I was making idle bullshit. I was, and I, and I am serious. We trust each other, and we pretty much share everything on our phone, and 
and all the time, be it a puppy, a car, she loves dogs and is car crazy, or something one of her sisters sent her. Good, I'm glad she you let her see your phone, she sees your phone, she's great, loves dogs, loves cars, awesome. She always asks me if I'm okay with her going out with her friends and tells me who she's with and where she is going. Okay, good. She texts me when she gets there and sends me her route when she leaves. She uh, she tells me is so because I have plenty of time to get with my she tells me so I have plenty of time to get my girlfriend out of the house and plenty of time before she comes home. <laughs> Talk about balls. So she has a good sense of, I had a girlfriend who used to say the same shit to me. The house is spotless and she is one of the hardest working women I've ever known. Wonderful. We go to the beach every chance we get and take a long road trip together to get new get a new dog. I took a rifle rifle, rifle shooting and she loves it. There's something about a chick firing off rounds. I like that too. I have no idea how or why, but I have been double blessed. After all these stories, I keep thanking her, thanking her for being a good woman. This is what I've learned. Now we're going to get some good wisdom here from an older bro here, and I, I like this. It says, first, never say never. Opportunities happen when you least expect them. Things, uh, there are things that will happen in four years that do not exist today. Your mind and eyes need to be open enough to recognize them. If you decide not to act, that is your choice, but you should always be open to, enough to see them. Same goes for inspiration. Inspiration needs to be to find you working before it appears. Yeah. Four years before I started this YouTube channel, I sure as hell never imagined I'd be doing this full-time for a living. If you want to act single, be single. There's nothing wrong with being single. Just be open and admit it. If you want to commit a relationship, act like you are in one. You're either all in or none at all. The two are exclusive and not compatible. If you have any wonderlust at all, get it out of your system before committing. Don't fuck someone else's life up because you want to keep it. In, you won't keep it in your pants. I pissed a few women off in my single time because I refused to commit. They moved on, and I'm sure they're better off than I if I bullshitted them. Uh, know uh, what you want in a partner and the quality she needs to have. And know an enormous gravity-defying wreck should not be one of them. It's a nice bonus, though. Do not deviate from those standards. I agree. He says, never, ever settle, never. Have reasonable boundaries and ethics and stick to them. If a boundary is crossed once, that is a hurricane watch. If crossed twice, that is a hurricane warning. Hurricane warnings mean you evacuate the beach. And now, multiple incursions mean you're not respected. No respect, no love, no love, no relationship, evacuate. I've been saying since day one, if they don't respect you, they won't love you. You have to act like a fucking man, have balls, stand up for yourself, put them in their place when they're being assholes, and there are going to be days they're going to be assholes, and you get the point. And you have your life, you have your interests, and you don't change who you are for anyone. Amongst other things, but you all get the point. He says again, never ever settle. Be your partner and your equal. Notice I said equal and not the same. You are not the same. You are the boy and she is the girl. As a man, be the fucking man. Act like the man. Take responsibility as the man. Yes. If things get tough, don't bail like a little bitch. You made vows, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. To say, I didn't sign up for this is utter bullshit. Yes, Skippy, you did. And you are turning into a little bitch. Maria used to tell me how many men would have bailed instead of being with her as the wife's caregiver. I told her I made a promise, and I was not about to break that promise. Keep your fucking promise, you, need, you, nickel, you needle-dicked asshole. <laughs> well, a lot of guys would do all these things you're talking about, but the problem is there are many gals that won't reciprocate. They'll run for the hills when things get tough. It's sad, but it's the truth. He says, before I forget, don't settle. So we're noticing a pattern here. Don't fucking settle, guys. Now, we don't want to sound like these super proud modern gals that don't ever settle either, but the difference is, is that a lot of these gals, these high and mighty gals nowadays, they don't settle because they have a CVS scroll of a list of qualities. Well, guys aren't going to settle. When he says don't settle, he means don't settle for things that cross your boundaries, stuff like that. Uh, be your hero, even if you don't feel like one. Always make her feel safe. Women love safety and security. You are the alpha male. You don't need you don't need to walk around with your dick in your hand. You're either one or you're not. When it comes to your family, you are a hard ass. Period. Yes. Forgive and forget mistakes easily. And mistakes are like forgetting to bring home milk from the store or burning dinner. Sucking your manager's schlong in the living room is not a mistake. It's a choice, and we've all seen how to deal with those. That's why I say like these stories of these gals like I made a mistake. No, you didn't. You chose to do what you did over many, many times 
you know, forgetting to pay the electric bill or burning the burning dinner, that's a mistake. Uh, never go to bed pissed off. Work on your prompts and remember you are on the same side unless a bad choice has been made. Get some before bed and hug her in the morning like it is the last time you will ever do. One day it will be. Again, this is on the basis that you're married to someone that you truly love and she reciprocates. And he says, also, whatever you do, don't fucking settle. Appreciate the good woman you have. After all these stories, I thank Bianca. I thank Bianca for being a good woman. She tells me I'm the man her mother told her to marry. Well, as long as Bianca is treating you in that in the right way, which sounds like she is, then great. But all these lessons you've learned, my friend, in your life, and things you learn here, stick to them. Then I think you'll be fine with Bianca. Find things you can enjoy together. I bought a classic car, and she helped me put in the new interior. A good spouse will elevate you and help you be better. Build great memories together. A shitty one will tear you down with none of those good memories. Right. A good spouse, good wife will have your back. Good girlfriend, good fiance, good wife will have your back. And will happy, enjoy the things that make you happy and all that. Never, never get involved with a lazy person. It's hard, but not impossible to scale back a workaholic, but impossible to get a lazy slug off their ass. I detest lazy people. Watch how their family is and how she treats them. You marry her, you marry the entire family. Yes, I tell you to watch. Pay attention to your girl's family early on. See the dynamics. She treats them like shit. That ain't good. If there's always fighting and chaos, bad. But if they're all loving and supportive and all that, okay. Possible contender. Defend your family at all costs. She is dependent on you to be safe. If the shit hits the fan, you defend her no matter what is taking, what it takes, including taking a bullet. Now try to avoid trouble at all costs. Security systems, lighting, firearms, fences, dogs, etc. All should be first lines of defense. She knows, uh, she knows how to shoot, and if, I, if I'm run over, I gave her the tools to protect yourself. But when all else fails, it is on you, and your life isn't worth two piles of chicken shit if you turn coward. If she says, either me or the dog, you choose, pick the dog. <laughs> Amen. Or cat. Also, don't settle. And finally, never waste a day when you have the best. Make sure she knows it and always how important she is. Never settle for less than the best for you. Remember, where gender is not mentioned, these apply to women too. Some of these lessons I learned from, from uh, great women. Okay, man. Well, that is a hell of a story. And again, I'm, I'm so sorry what you went through with, with, with your your late wife. She sounds like an amazing woman. And it's quite interesting how you met her, you know, on that date and everything. But... Uh, Congratulations, bro, for getting through hell. And I'm glad you found a woman that you married that you have a fantastic thing with. I really hope it continues, you know. But keep on what you have learned and things you learn here and everything is going to be great. And I know you know you're, what, you're 20 years older than me, so you have a lot more life experience than me. But you wouldn't be watching me if you didn't think I knew I, I had a good points on this channel. So I'm glad to hear that. And I'm also not surprised about you being bombarded by all these chicks sh barely after, you know, you... Laid your, uh, uh, laid your wife to rest. I'm all surprised they're bombarding you with attention. And of course, the train wreck that is Tinder, and I had to smack you. Can't blame. What was this? I, I got to smack. I got to smack you at least once in one of these videos. I got to find some reason to do it. But anyhow, uh, great story, man. I'm glad you're doing well. So carry on. And I really hope you have a great thing going. And you got plenty of years to live, my man. You got to hit 100 years old. I'm aiming to hit 100 years old. So I got to do what I got to do to take care of myself, keep my mind sharp, my body healthy and all that. And hopefully I can make 100. Then after 100, we'll see what happens. Although I really hope I want to be around at 100 the way this country is going. But nope, no need to get into politics here, even though sometimes I'm dying to open my mouth on the subject. But it won't do well for my channel. All right, guys, that is it for today. Be sure to comment down below. Let me know what you think about this. Give this guy a shout-out. And if you like the video, share it with your friends and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time.